Thank you for joining us for this exciting event. <laughs> we are going to now convene into a budget workshop. And because that's well beyond my skill level, I'm going to refer to Dr. Wallace, who then can continue to refer to <laughs> <laughs> and keep us informed on this. So as you're accustomed, we normally do a budget workshop this month. As, uh, and again, I, I would remind the board just also that we do not have board meetings in July, so just so you're aware of that right now. Uh, but the workshop is a part of giving you uh, the heads up on where we are with our budget. There's no voting today. It's just a workshop, a lot of Q&A, presentational. You're going to see a lot of data. That portion of this is about 80 pages, so you understand why this is such a thick book this time. Um, but uh, please stop us during presentations asked. Dr. Miller's going to take the lead on this. Uh, but this is what will ultimately be voted on in August for our new budget year. But you're not voting on this tonight, so it's a good opportunity to learn, ask questions, and even in the future ask those questions as we come to the final approval or, or shifts if you uh, request any. So Dr. Miller will let you start and we'll tag team where we need to tag it. All right. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Um, once again, we've come to that time of year where we find ourselves putting together a new budget. And the entire budget process gives us an opportunity to look back over the past 12 months and see what's happened and how those actions will impact what's going to occur over the next 12 months. And if you want to reflect back to June of last year, this institution was in uncharted territory. Virtually all of our campus facilities were closed. Despite our best efforts to move all instruction online, student enrollments were dropping substantially. And bottom line, nobody knew how long these conditions were going to remain. So last year, we slashed our budget by almost 10%, and we still found it necessary to eliminate a significant number of positions early in the fall term. But as the 2020-21 school year progressed, those actions proved to be crucial to financially surviving the pandemic. Little did we know well, this time last summer that the federal government was going to step in on three separate occasions and inject an unprecedented amount of funds into higher education. But as we begin the budget process for this next year, I don't think there's a single person in this room that doesn't feel like the worst of the pandemic is behind us. Most of us fully expect to return somewhat to normal over this coming year. And as CFO, I agree with that. But I think as we plan our next budget, we can't presume that those changes will happen until we actually see them happen. So for that reason, the preliminary budget that you're going to see tonight is very similar to the current year's budget. We're not going to be presumptuous and return to pre-pandemic levels of spending without actually seeing some return to pre-pandemic levels of enrollment. So if these student enrollments increase, whether it happens in the fall or in the spring, we can then look at increasing spending to levels in line with the increase in operational revenues. So I want to work through the information that you have in your board packet. And first of all, want to look at the major sources of revenue. And we have quite a bit of supporting documentation here. A lot of it is just informational. It's information we take into account in trying to create our new budget. But also, I think it's important to report that information to you on a periodic basis. And the annual budget is a good opportunity to do that. Of course, one of our major streams of funding comes from the state government, state appropriations. Well, for the first time in a long time, our actual appropriations are going down. Uh, we have a drop in enrollment, and as a result, the, the timing of the pandemic, the pandemic started less than two weeks after the base year began. So, uh, we, we are. <laughs> I think our advocates in Austin were arguing this is not an accurate reflection to be using this time frame, but uh, for various reasons, the, the state went through with, um, with the cutting funding. So uh, what we have is a drop of approximately $315,000 in this upcoming year. Some of the additional items, the benefits and such, we'll get those 
uh, numbers later on during the summer. And, and I can fill in the rest of this chart. But for now, we do know our base appropriation will be down a little over $300,000 from the current biennium. Next, we move into tuition. And because of our situation here at the college with a, a, a somewhat limited tax base, but serving a very populous uh, service area, um, we, we find that tuition is where we have to look for the majority of our revenues. Uh, the first page that you see there is just simply a chart to show you that whether we're talking about in-district, branch campus, out-of-district, non-resident tuition, all of our tuition rates are going to be held at the same level now for three consecutive years. Uh, I can't find a previous point in our history when that has occurred. Um, Typically, uh, we do raise it at least every other year, if not every year, but we are holding firm for one more year. And one reason we're doing that, I can point to the next couple of pages. I'll show you the survey results from the Texas Association of Community Colleges, where we can compare our tuition rates with those of our colleagues across the state. And you can see from this first page that our industry tuition ranks as the 19th highest in the state. And honestly, about 10% of our enrollment is in district, where the majority of our funds come from is out of district. And when you look at the next page, you see we are currently the fifth highest in the state. And what is most concerning about that is you realize significant portions of our enrollment come from an um, area just south of us that is not part of any college tax, taxing district. So those students that come to us, they pay out of district. But also if they go to any other community college, they pay out of district. And I'll just point out at the bottom part of that chart, you'll find Dallas, Grayson, Tarrant, and Collin. Those are actually options for students who um, are in Denton County, and we have to be cognizant of that. And we have to really struggle to provide the, the services that we want to provide there to those people in Denton County. And it's very challenging doing that without any sort of tax. And um, so we have to rely on the tuition. So we've made every, every effort to hold the line on that for yet another year. And uh, hopefully uh, we can continue to do that. In the final page in this section, I'm showing the, the student cost of attendance, which once again shows what a bargain community colleges in general are. And I think if you, if you look at the traditional 18, 19 year old that has the opportunity to quote unquote stay at home for the first year or two and not go off to a four year school, you can take $6,000 worth of room and board off of that figure. And we're talking about a cost of attendance around $8,000 compared to these other universities in our area. Um, so just wanted you to see what, uh, what a bargain community college education is for students in our area. And um, again, please, this is, a, this is a workshop, so please talk if you have any questions online. I'm, I'm, I should know this, and I've gone blank on the end point. Uh, at one point, we had an agreement, and Melinda, this may be a question for you. We had an agreement with MSU where they were matching tuition rates for our students so that they're not paying the MSU rate. Right? Is that agreement still going on? Yes. They complete. They have to complete a degree with yes. us. Yes. Uh, and so that helps too to, to emphasize the partnership we have done there financially in the tuition and fee category. It's still a great deal for a student, for example, to finish with us at the better rate that Dr. Miller pointed out, and then they keep that rate if it happened to be a transfer to MSU. And so that's been really, and I'm not even sure if we have informed the board of that program. Uh, it's, pretty, it's been very successful. I hope it's going to be. Yes, it's going to be. We just recently notified the students about that oh. option, too. Any, any other questions about anything on the tuition <coughs> numbers? I would reemphasize to the board the importance that we find in keeping our tuition where we are trying to right now because whether we like this term or not, we are in a 
competitive market, and we are in a competitive market with colleges with large and robust tax districts, but we're also in a competitive market with the online college uh, of today that, that promises a lot, and in my opinion doesn't always deliver that, uh, but um, it is a very difficult task when you, you, if you overprice yourself, and that's why we're continuing to do our best to keep that tuition right where it's been for a few years now. The next portion of revenue that I want to discuss is property tax. And there's not a whole lot we can say or do right now about property tax because we do not have our certified tax values. They usually come in around the last week of July. So that will be coming in and we'll have updated information for you at the August meeting. But I did want you to show, I, I know I'm not telling you anything new with this first chart that NCTC tax rate is a blip on the radar compared to the other taxing entities mm -hmm. in our area. Um, and you'll see how on the average home in Cook County, they pay $186 a tax to NCTC compared to in some cases over $2,000 to their local ISD. So just, just wanted to make sure you saw that. And on the next page, this is kind of a historical represent, representation of valuations and tax rates. Um, like I said, we do not have certified tax values in yet, but we have some preliminary values that were made public to or made available to us in April. And I can tell you across the board, those numbers are up eight to 10% over the previous year's numbers. So all things remaining equal, the m and tax rate would be expected to fall for the coming year to be no new tax rate. And in fact, I would expect based on what it did last year, um, if we move forward with no new tax rate, um, our tax rate's gonna be below seven cents. It's gonna be six something. But I want you to keep that in mind. If you look back on that chart, it looks like the last year we raised the m and rate at all was in 2016. So we've had five years in a row that we've gone with that no new tax rate. And um, of course they changed the law in the last legislature. And uh, if we were to go up and try to collect 8% or more of additional tax revenue, there would be no choice. We would have to go out for an election to do that. But we do have the option of raising it between zero and 8% in doing that with a tax hearing and then simply voting, ha having you vote on that. So I want y'all to keep that in mind as we enter these last couple of months and we find out what those tax values are, we're going to have to decide what we want to do. And I'm interested to hear feedback uh, that you may have about that. But before I get your feedback, let's look at some of the, I want you to see uh, the next three charts, again, comparing us statistically with other community colleges in Texas. One quick uh, history uh, reminder for us, because it seems like an eternity ago, but when we passed uh, the, the board, uh, and when the community passed the bond for the health science and ITC, the tax rate total was 0.14, I believe, at that point in time. That would have been in 2011. And so that gives you even further evidence to show that even with our bond payments, we're now at the nine cent level, which is, is not something I think we would have forecasted when we passed that bond at that point, that we'd see such a reduction over that short period of time. Okay, okay, sure. Um, if, if you look at the valuations uh, for our taxing district, which is, of course, Cook County, it's about, about four point, it has been about 4.3, uh, trillion dollars worth of tax base and that tax base would place us um, at number 34 out of 50 colleges um, as, as far as the, the values of our taxes but if you look at the next page the MNO rate that 7.283 cents that we have we are ranked number 48 out of 50 there's only two community colleges with a lower tax rate. We have a situation where, honestly, our tax rate is so low 
and the valuation is so small, there's not a lot of revenue to be generated by going through the process of increasing taxes. For example, with, uh, with us collecting about $3 million of m and tax revenue, um, if you can go up 8% without a, 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 having a rollback election, 8% is roughly $240,000. In a $60 million budget, you know, we've got flexibility to garner an extra $240,000. And so I understand that it's kind of the risk-reward thought, is it worth going through that process? But at the same time, I want you to realize that when we do go five, six, seven years, whatever it's been, since we've gone up on the taxes, that rate keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and, and, and we lose any ability to, to generate or garner any revenue whatsoever. So I, I do think it's something we need to look at, we need to address, and we need to evaluate if we think it's worth um, some level of increase. Um, just the first thought that came to my mind, if those preliminary tax values hold true that I got in April, we're looking at in excess of an increase of eight. Well, it's more than an 8% increase in values. That would tell me we could go up 7, 7.5%, just throwing out that number. Our tax rate would still fall because there was an 8 to 9% increase in values in the district. So, you know, I just think there's an opportunity when, when you can uh, communicate to your public, you're giving a lower tax rate than you charged the year before, and yet we're still able to uh, receive additional funds in doing that. It's kind of a win-win situation. The college gets more money, and yet the taxpayers still see a lower tax rate. Uh, than what they paid the previous year. So uh, that may be something that you would like for us to consider uh, and look at as we finalize the budget. Any questions on those tax rates? Okay, the next section that I put in here, of course, is, is brand new. We, we normally don't talk about federal funding and the impact that it has on our budget, but boy, it played a big role this past year, and it will continue to play uh, a role in the coming year. Uh, I put together a chart that I've shared a couple of times with the Finance Committee, uh, I believe, at least once, if not twice. Um, this is an attempt to show the various uh, funding streams we have received from the federal government. First, it was the CARES Act. Then it was Carissa, and now we've entered the third phase, which is called ARPA. Um, so they all have their own clever acronym name, and in each case, there was student allocation, there was institutional allocation. On the first two, there was also a third category called strengthening institutional programs that was additional institutional dollars. You see smaller amounts <coughs> under CARES and Carissa there. We haven't received word if there's going to be anything like that under ARPA or not. But we just got these last ARPA numbers in uh, uh, mid-May. So we, there, there could, could still be additional uh, information coming forward about that that we have not yet been told about. But this is an effort to show as of May 31st how, how much uh, spending has actually occurred and been charged against these uh, federal funds. And there's a few uh, nice little pie charts there to graphically represent student aid. Honestly, if this had been done the 1st of May, we had spent 90, over 98% of our student aid had been dispersed by the 1st of May. But then in mid-May, they announced an additional $8 million that's going directly to students. So now you look at that chart at the end of May and it looks like We've been 
delinquent getting those funds out, and it's not, it's not it at all. We, we, were, we had virtually spent all of our first two allotments, but now there's a third round, and we'll be waiting until the fall. We're, we're, we've got a couple of projects underway right now, but for the most part, that's going to come into play in the fall semester. Institutional aid, uh, we have spent about half of that allocation, but we still have significant dollars remaining. And I wanted to specifically show you on the third chart um, because this last round of funding, over half of the money we receive in ARPA is mandated directly to students. The college cannot spend that money. We cannot use it on ourselves. It has to go out to the students. And what I've attempted to show in this third graph is that even the institutional funds that the college has received, a significant portion of those institutional funds are still going out to students. It's just the nature of the restrictions that the government placed on how we can use these funds. We couldn't use the student funds, but you can see here almost a quarter of our institutional aid has essentially been used for our students. It took the form of discounted tuition, which yes, that helped the college, absolutely, because they were paying us tuition dollars, but it was aid for students as well. And there's also student technology purchases of um, laptops, computers, some things like that. And then there was student emergency aid that students could apply for that had fallen on hard times. And so, I just wanted, wanted you to realize that even the institutional funds in many cases are directly impacting our students as well. And as we are creating a budget for the next year, absolutely these federal funds have created very much of a, if you want to call it a safety net or a, a, a blanket, a, it, it's obviously nice to have that. We have to be very careful because we can't obligate ourselves to recurring expenses that when the federal streams cut off, which I would expect to happen in this next year, we have to be careful that we have not now committed ourselves to things that are ongoing and recurring and we will have to build in to the next year's budgets. Um, a lot of, that's one reason we have honestly avoided things like salaries, because once we create positions or create additions to salary, yeah, those government dollars can help this year, but when they're gone, then it falls on us to put those back into the budget uh, for moving forward. So we're trying to be prudent and we're having to be very careful in uh, how we're spending those funds and what we're doing. We have a, a limited time period here to do this, I'm, and I appreciate what you're saying, don't understand me, but the, talking about how we're going to pay people, um, we got about 10 minutes left. Can we kind of spend some time on that? Okay, sure, um, sure. That part of it, the, the salary increases and the rest of it, um, some of us have received some questions about that. So Absolutely. Uh, and Dr. Wallace, do you want to start off sure. first talking about you the salary have, study? Uh, you have a plethora of information in your packet, and I will go through anything in which you have a question. We also have Kay, uh, a trader here who has been, her team has been doing a, all, all this work, honestly, with our, our, our management. But what I want to give you is a brief history on the first page there, salary increases. It gives you a reminder of what we've done over the past since 2014 and what we're proposing we'll discuss in just a moment. You also see the next page, the per time instructional wages per hour. Uh, this has to do with part-time faculty, and what we are proposing in the new year's budget is taking us from 590 currently to 650. If you turn the page, that puts us at a far better rank than we've ever been with our faculty salaries, and a far better rank than we've ever been with our part-time instructor salaries. So you see us moving that rank to a better position. Uh, we are finding it difficult to hire faculty when our competitors are paying a per, and I'm talking part-time in this case, 
very difficult to find faculty that will commit to a part-time instructional load if you're comparing us to the Dallas's and the Collins and the larger taxing districts. This doesn't meet necessarily that level, but it certainly gives us um, a lot more uh, marketability and equity in our pay scale for our part-time. That was also something that was important to the Faculty Senate. They brought that up more than once in the past that they, they would uh, appreciate uh, and then even many times said that we'd appreciate our adjuncts getting a raise even if they couldn't. So I, I appreciate that, but we've been able to garner both for them. Now when you begin to look into the overall employment data, you begin to look into our, our, our what we provide our, our faculty and our staff, I think it's very important to understand as we look at the compensation package that it goes far beyond what our employees are paid as a base salary. I think you need to, and what we've done ourselves is really look at the notion of what does a salary really reflect in total compensation, and that is total uh, amount that it, it costs the institution and that we provide the, the employee. So for example, an individual who makes uh, in the 30s, let's say $30,000 salary, their total compensation that the college pays for health benefits for just the employee, for retirement, for matching, becomes 46000 so you have anywhere of a spread that in, in the average that an individual on a salary it could be as much as 50 percent of that salary is also being additionally paid by the college for their benefit package so i think it's important in when you think about time off uh personal leave time vacation time benefits that the work we've done even is more important as we move forward so what have we done we've spent almost over a year now uh, evaluating every job at the college and every job means we've done 237 uh, different evaluations for every, every single position in the college. They were evaluated by the individual holding the position, wrote the PDQ, then the supervisors worked to, to finalize and work that PDQ, then it went through the vice chancellor for those departments, then it went to our third party vendor Gallagher to study and do market research and value those. You have the entire distribution of how we've gone about that fair market value. I draw your attention to that PowerPoint for just a moment. And specifically, I would like you to look at the actual classification bands. So you see that we're moving from something that was created probably around 20 years ago to a new band method. And that new band method is A through F. And it depends on what your job level is, how you manage individuals. The band method, if you're a, if you're a business major, has been around for a long time. Uh, it's used by both corporate and education. I know, for example, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know the Lynn uses this model, uh, and I think maybe even some of our other colleagues do, because you'll see comparatives of where we've looked at other colleges, other universities. But the band method basically says, hey, if you're determining a matter of speed to perform and define that, you may be an A. Then the A coordination can go from one to 13 to one and three. That gets really detailed. I don't want to bog down in that, but it's quantifiable. And it's quantifiable in a new way that we've not been able to do in the past. If you look at page uh, 10 of that uh, PowerPoint, you'll see the following cohort groups that we use to, to, to base our data off of for the CUPAHR program. That's all 50 of the community colleges in the state of Texas. You turn the page once more, you see that we even went deeper and looked at university market demand. If you turn the page to 12, you'll see where we looked at city pay scales. Those in green were the ones that actually replied to our surveys, which is pretty healthy when you consider the count. I point out Death County did, Cook County did, cities that we served did, uh, very important for that. You begin to look at what you come to is, uh, uh, what we've chosen to do is a new band method. And if you go into um, page 22, you see the new uh, recommended pay structure. We went from 16K, I believe, for like 101 through 116 <coughs> uh, on our staff pay scale to a pretty comprehensive scale. Now, where you see individual things like C44, C51, C44 would, rec would recognize that someone could be in that pay grade that is moving through the institution and has an opportunity for future growth, and that's why you see some duplicated pay grade information. But if you look at the midpoint now, you look at the minimum 
The minimum originally for an NCTC employer at A11, the equivalency before this study was $19,000. So what does this translate to? It translates to the following. It translates to what we've done is we've tried to bring all employees in their new pay grade in the budget to the new minimum, minimally. Does that make sense? So in other words, if you are grossly underpaid, according to new pay grade, you're brought to the minimum of that new pay grade. The remainder of individuals that may not be getting that will be getting a 2% raise of the new midpoint. So they're still benefiting, had we been in our old pay grade system, we would be saying that's a lot less money, a lot less raise of the 2% midpoint there for everyone in this program. What it does is it starts you. It gives you the start point. It gives you the ability to say, hey, you know, we know that this isn't perfect, but this is the way we start. Also, we're giving every full-time faculty member a $1,500 raise. You can see in that report, too, in here, that we have given you the, the, the TCCTA report where that would move us. Van, correct me if I'm wrong, it moves us to a, like, several uh, points in the new data to where we're now no longer in the midpoint, we're a little bit above the midpoint as far as our faculty pay stands. So you can't go past six. But I can do the summary, yes, sir. So that's where we are. Uh, we are open to any questions you have about um, these pay grades. You can look at what that means, and then Dr. Miller can just give you real quickly, if you go to that page following my presentation, he'll give you the, the final review of the actual budget proposed. But questions about the... So would it be fair to say that, I know we've talked about, hey, how do we, instead of just giving everybody the same thing across the board to make it much more merit-based, this seems to be more of a merit-based... It is not merit-based, Mr. Grimes, it is not. Okay. Um, merit-based is a whole other... Uh, this is still what you would consider classification-based raise, not merit. Uh, someone that could have received a less than stellar performance would still get the same raise as when someone that has a stellar performance. The only time we don't give raises at NCTC is uh, if you don't work for us. So we're just, I mean, basically just being bringing, honest. We're basically, in this method, we're bringing the bottom up to a more marketable value. Marketable value. Right. right. Okay. I'll give you a good example. Is there, is there a reason we didn't look at something more merit-based to go to like we had discussed? I'm not convinced that we have the staff available in time. I have a colleague who did that system in the state. It took them four years and a probably 30-member HR team to make it happen. Um, and they don't give any cost of living raises to anyone now. It's fully merit-based. And there's a committee within each division that determines if you give a high level evaluation, it has to go to committee. If you give a low evaluation, it has to go to committee. You have to justify giving someone a perfect score or a low score. And if you don't rank within the midpoints, you don't get raises. Okay. What, so you also talked about the other means of compensation, not just what they're paid. Have, are those state required like so yes. much matching? So sure. there's nothing we can do to go, hey, the only thing we have, have this or that. Yeah, the only thing we have control over would be, would be personal leave. Uh, we have control over vacation, technically. Um, those are the things we have control. We do not have control over match funds for retirement and or health insurance. Now, what is different than years past for people who serve on this board a longer period of time is because we have a <coughs> steady enrollment growth, the state used to reimburse you at a better rate your insurance and your retirement things. We're now, the onus is fully on NCTC for anyone hired in the last, oh my goodness, eight years for sure, if not 10. Okay. We feel, well, yeah. the irony of that is our drop in enrollment this year, that may change this next year because we have a drop in enrollment. So, uh, we don't get docked for those new hires. We encourage you to read through this. We realizing that this is not a done deal tonight. This this is the workshop for it, and we will follow up in um, August with the official vote on the budget. At which point, you may have a lot more questions. Then I will say though later on in the board agenda, I'll present to you uh, a.
question about whether you're comfortable with the Gallagher study or not, then we can discuss that at that point, Mr. Chairman. So uh, we'll do a brief overview then of that. Completely. I, I would just ask you at the very end of this section, uh, it kind of all comes together. Uh, the actual budget on that multicolored page there, there's just under a $1 million surplus with everything that's in that budget as it stands. But we have not addressed salaries yet within that budget. So the very last page are the, the cost of the proposed salary adjustments that we would uh, be requesting be made to that budget. And um, there's the cost of implementing the Gallagher study, full-time employee increases, part-time increases. It's about $1.2 million worth of salary adjustments. And if those are approved, that would move that $1 million surplus to about a quarter of a million deficit. But I tell you, that's why it's important to realize this is fluid. What we're doing right now, it's not finished because between now and August, um, I can tell you a couple of things right off bat that could very likely happen. If our enrollment is up any this fall over last fall, we made all of our revenue projections off of this past year, which was the lowest year we've had in a long time. If we're up in enrollment, and we know that come uh, first day of class around the August board meeting, we can make adjustments to our tuition revenue and, and move that up. We still have a $1 million contingency built into this budget. Worst case scenario, we move forward with this increase and we have a $700,000 contingency. So I full, fully expect to be presenting a balanced budget with all of these changes one way or the other. And I would like to just point out the negative position that we're presenting this evening would not have been in place had the state funded at home hold harmless. That was 315,000. All right, anybody have further questions? Happy to discuss it. Okay. Let me in the case, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, let me in the case. It is 6.07, and I would formally call this meeting to order. We have established a quorum, and that would lead us to citizens' communication, which I do Maybe not see. I don't believe we had any communication. No. Sandy is out ill this evening, well, ladies and gentlemen, but she's taking the from a distance. <laughs> that leaves us to reports. Uh, finance Secretary Morris. Yes, finance met June 23rd. We discussed the June agenda items, which include two requests for proposals, one for depository services and the other for auditing services. And we discussed the third quarter investment report, which you'll see later. We also reviewed the Whitley Penn audit, which was completed in 2019. Uh, most of those action items have been implemented. Um, full com implementation is expected soon, but it was disrupted by the pandemic. And we also reviewed uh, the budget, the preliminary budget. And then finally, we talked about the uh, <coughs> May financial statement. Thank you. Uh, Executive Committee, I believe we canceled that. They did not meet. Therefore, student success, Regent Henderson. No, we didn't meet with this board. Do we have anything, Debbie? Uh, yeah, uh, we did meet. Um, Doing the job? John, I think, has it. Yeah, okay, so, good. Yeah. Um, Dr. King had uh, provided an update. <coughs> Instruction has continued to make changes to help all students be successful. While some courses are back face to face, the majority will still be taught online in, combination, uh, in a combination of formats. Along with faculty getting better at using technology, several instrumental support areas have been, uh, noticed increased use of students ex uh, accessing through online services. They include the library of services, um, ask a librarian electronic databases. Tutoring online tutoring has increased significantly, as well as uh, redesign of the e-learning department to better meet college needs. Uh, Melinda Carroll also provided an update on student services um, and she and her department have been working hard with the students uh, and they've continued to work to meet with students where they are on the to NCTC as well as provide the students engagement and support uh, with several opportunities throughout the academic year. Um, we discussed uh, several um, events on campus that they've had to support inclusion and engagement. 
Also, um, with registration for fall 2021 underway, beginning July 6th, the student services team will begin outreach to students promoting future registration, including three audiences. Um, people who've applied the previous semester but didn't attend, uh, there's about 839 students from spring of 21, 2021. Re-registration for continuing students, and also re uh, registration for stopouts. Um, Debbie had provided an external affairs update, <coughs> including during fall 2020 semester that 12%, uh, a little over 12%, almost 13% of NCTC students received scholarships. Uh, almost 77% of scholarship recipients were successful with a C or better in their courses, and 81% of the scholarship recipients were retained from fall semester to spring. Uh, an average GPA of the scholarship recipients was 3.27, so that's really cool. Um, also, uh, the emergency fund that they've established has uh, helped approximately 60 students with about $265, and um, about 88% of those who get the help actually complete the semester. And I think it's really neat to me, and you just realize how fortunate you are when $265 can help you finish a, a semester. Um, so a good, good job with, with uh, everything they're doing in, in external affairs. Uh, at the meeting, Melinda also shared some various data points related to the future uh, executive dashboard, including student enrollment data, um, total enrollment data by semester, race, race ethnicity, age, gender, uh, and student tuition status. Used to, I guess, we were having to go through several different places to get all this, and I think it's exciting to be able to get some of these things kind of at the uh, drop of a hat in the future. Um, also, the committee was provided with additional dashboards regarding uh, student conversion and yield rates for the current and upcoming semesters. I I'd also like to, I guess, commend the employees here at NCTC. Um, in 2020, well, every year for the past five years or so, they've been doing an employee giving <coughs> campaign. And in 2020, um, and you just figure this crazy year of COVID, um, in 2020, they gave $54,000 and about 65% of the staff, uh, faculty had, had uh, contributed and this year. They gave $71,000 and about 69% of the staff uh, gave. And I think that's, uh, I think that this faculty and staff ought to be committed for really kind of giving back to the students. I think that was great. Thank you. Uh, that moves us to the to the regents, and we would start with Bob. Yeah, I want to give you a uh, brief update of what's going on in Corinth. As you all know, we have the uh, winter storm damage. We're just almost finished with that project. Our restoration and mitigation uh, company that's been uh, working for the last four, four months or so. They are about to wrap up all of the uh, repairs uh, by the end of the week. So hopefully uh, first part of July we'll start moving everything back in. As a matter of fact, we have moved some office furniture back in this week. So we had a lot of that stuff damaged as well. So we've got to reorder some. And some of that might not be in July. So hopefully we're still <coughs> shooting to be all ready and everything moved back in and everyone back come back in for the fall semester. Uh, the good news is uh, we did settle up with our insurance company on claim. And we settled at uh, $3,760,000. And to date, we've paid our that company a little over $3 million. Right around $3 million. They still have one more in, uh, invoice to send us. And uh, whatever that is, that they'll probably take the remaining Three, three million seven hundred six thousand. So that's uh, everything minus our deductible of twenty five thousand dollars. So that's our out of pocket cost for that whole entire three point seven million dollars for the next. Uh, we also did a few things outside the claim that uh, once we had an October up, we couldn't realize that we needed to rearrange some things, do things more difficult, pull down some walls, and. Uh, Actually, the third floor flooring, we could have left it as is, but it wasn't the match the second and third, so we went in and did that as well. So a few things like that we're going to pay for outside of the claim, so it's another out-of-pocket expense. Uh, we're going to convert uh, our food services and use uh, Great Western Dining. 
for down there as well. So that's going to require a little bit of remodeling as well. But all in all, we're in good shape. So really just one thing I want to update the board on because you'll hear from me on other things throughout the night. Um, some of us uh, recently were able to meet, there's a new committee that has been formed by the city of Graham and that new committee is focusing on helping undergird and support uh, NCTCs or in Graham and, and there's a four member community team that's been created. Uh, we're very pleased to say that they're, they're wanting to try to work with the college on a 5, 10, and 15 year kind of trajectory. What can they do? I remind you that in Graham, Texas, if you're a Graham resident and student, there, there, there is no one paying uh, their tuition there. That community basically covers all tuition for any student wishing to go to school. Uh, and so tuition is not so much and scholarship is growing and we're working on that program that we'll talk about uh, after a meeting in Dallas we all have tomorrow, which we're excited about, that's going to undergird our rural campuses with some extra uh, funds and extra ways for us to really help students complete. But one of the things is uh, the board has discussed over a period of years is someone that regularly attends our board meetings from that maintenance tax district. They've appointed Ellen Morris. Ellen has served uh, for many years on our foundation board and, and, and has been a great uh, person for working with the college. She's going to begin in August attending board meetings just to be here, to be a part of that. And you all have questions. Uh, I, we had offered, if you were a mind friend in the past, uh, we may offer them quarterly an opportunity to present to the board their ideas and what they believe would, would help uh, bolster that. Uh, we remind the board that, that they do pay a maintenance tax. And so we appreciate that they are part of our taxing entity. Uh, and so anyway, we're very excited about that. We're also excited, uh, we, we have a retirement. Uh, Kim is retiring, which we're not excited about her retiring, but we appreciate her, her work for years. But we are excited to say that we have a new candidate who has accepted the position to direct that campus, who is, um, I don't know that I can make that public her name yet, uh, but uh, Dr. Megan Bunyard. Dr. Bunyard has served with us before. As is coming uh, from, uh, I believe it's from Howard Payne as the vice president there, but will be coming to the Graham campus to manage that campus. We're excited with our academic background that we believe it can grow. And so we're working diligently with that campus and appreciate their efforts to uh, make sure that they, uh, they work with us as much as they can. So we'll look forward to that in the future. Great. Dr. Miller, three things. Yes. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Uh, it's time for the financial report, and I'll be much briefer this time. Um, but it, I would just call your attention to a couple of things. The first page on statement of funds toward the top, total reserves increased uh, by $1 million last month, and that was due to uh, what we said we were going to do last month, set, setting aside $1 million of the federal funding to board reserves. And uh, actually, I'd just tell you that uh, shortly after the month of June began, we also had the closing of the land sale in Corinth. So after that, another 1.6 was transferred over to board reserves. It just didn't show up in this because this is as of May 31st. But just to let you know that, that those additional funds will show up on that line for this next month. Um, and then I'd also, I, it seems like every month I like to show off the cash flow report because uh, it's doing so well and I just want you to uh, take notice of that. We're, we're in good shape with our cash balances. And the final thing I wanted to mention that actually leads over into the next item, the next report is a report regarding the third quarter investment report. And this is the quarterly report that is mandated by the state that uh, you are presented these results. You don't have to vote or act on them, but we do need documentation that it has been presented to you. And so that is also included for your review. Any questions about the donations? Thank you. Well, now, they've been, I'm, now I'll go into the slides for the affirmation report. Um, what, once every 10 years, the college undergoes uh, reaffirmation. 
of our regional accreditation. And that accreditation comes from the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. For the past two years, we've been working first on our compliance report, which was submitted in March of this year, and then a focused report, which we're working on now, that's going to be submitted within a matter of weeks. And then finally, we're going to have a visiting committee that's going to come to our campuses in mid-September. The actual dates are September 13th through the 16th. It's going to be a visiting team consisting of eight peer evaluators from across the South. And several of you have been through this process before, but many of you, uh, this may be your first experience. Just want you to know that one or more of you may very well be called on to visit with the team when they come in. And I'm sure Sandy would appreciate it if you are going to be available that week, just let Sandy know, or if you're out of town and you won't be here, that's fine too. But sometimes even at the last minute, they may want to talk to a regent or two, and it'll be nice for Sandy to be able to reach out and make contact uh, so that you might come by and chat with them. In addition to the traditional compliance report uh, that has always been a part of our accreditation. We're also preparing a quality enhancement plan, or QEP, as part of this process. And this time around, our QEP is called Aspire to be Hired, and it's gonna focus on employability skills to NCTC students. And the hope is that these skills will enhance graduates' career attainment and improve their long-term success in the workplace, providing identifiable, marketable skills and employment sustainability. So this entire reaffirmation process is a huge opportunity for NCTC to document the great things that we're doing with our students. And we look forward to showing these guests everything that we're doing. Any questions about the SACS process? As a part of the quality enhancement plan, when you adopt the fall uh, budget, the formal budget, uh, you will need to verify that we have placed funds in that budget for the quality enhancement plan. So that will be something that we will make sure we emphasize for you, and it is there, but that is one of the board responsibilities that we will remind you today that that would be important to do that. They will interview a collection of you, I, I bet I guarantee, because three of our visitors are presidents. And so <laughs> they would want to do that. So thank you. Thank you. We're good to go. All right. That would move us on to consideration of approval of the consent agenda. It has been presented in the package. Uh, we've entertained questions, uh, things to discuss based on the consent agenda. If there are no questions, I would entertain a motion to accept. And they would accept the consent agenda. Have a second? Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. All right. This is moving us to consideration of approving sale of certain real property in and tax free sale be for property located in Gray and Texas. Actually, you've done all of that, Mr. Hayne. You can move all the way to discussion and possible action items on the second page. All right. The consent was fairly robust. Yes. <laughs> but there we go. Yes. Okay. Uh, consideration of approving a non-academic, or do you want to move to you discussion? Did. That's right. Questions? Yes, sir. That's okay. where we need to go. Consideration of approving Gallagher study there for the compensation. Perfect. For your charge. So um, mm -hmm. not to um, re-emphasize what you've already heard in the um, budget workshop, but what this does is, is not as complex as you may think. This is similar to what you've done in the past when you've enabled us to tentatively plan on a raise or a compensation shift so that the administration can actually begin to do the paperwork side of this. So what we're asking for this evening, honestly, is the administration recommending approval for the study to be implemented to allow us to begin the preparation necessary. But it's still contingent on your adopting the final budget in August. So if for some reason you're still not comfortable with the study at that point, you could retract that with the adoption of the budget. In years past, we would have said we're giving, this, this narrative would have said 2% of the midpoint of the range and given us permission still knowing that you have to adopt in August. But uh, we would recommend allowing us to move forward with that, but we're open to any questions you may have about that study or that plan or if you have any concerns that, uh, about us beginning to process those, those payroll forms. So, 
question. I have a question. Are there any employees that will receive less compensation? Absolutely not. And when uh, will they be notified? So it is very difficult to notify if we don't pass this. What we're going to attempt to do is once you approve this this evening, they would be notified in the letter that they normally are, that this is the intended salary package they will receive contingent on the board approval of the budget. So that's what we normally do. We do that both on a faculty side and a staff administrative side. Letter of intent, but no binding in So it will be their complete compensation? Yes, we are planning a complete compensation report, which is very different to us, that shows what your health package is, what your time off equates to. It, we have a new budget calculator that basically says if this is your salary, this is how much you're also earning in leave, vacation, time off that's not vacation, health, and retirement. Why do we do that ahead of the budget? Why don't we do it all at once? Just more of a question. I'm not sure I understand that. I mean, I'm sorry. Why don't we send the preemptive package out if we haven't adopted the budget to each Why would we? Why would we? We always do just because that's sort of the nature of the beast in higher ed. You send out to faculty, for example, you'll send out a letter of intent to offer them a contract, but you actually can't offer the contract till August. So it's sort of just what we do. now. I have been a part of institutions that did not do that for staff. We've chosen to do it in CPC for years to say, here's what that equates to, here's what your raise would mean to you. Uh, we started that though bluntly when you gave contracts to those individuals. Uh, and now the board decided several years ago not to offer administrative contracts. So it could be, you could cease that, but we chose to just do that. And it's an easier thing for us to make sure we standardize the form than it is to leave to each individual manager to try to communicate that all at once. Uh, but um, that's why we've typically done that. Questions? Uh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Just to make sure that I clarify your question, Ms. Morris, no one is receiving less compensation. Did Gallagher say that some levels were overpaid for their work? Yes. But we made a very strong statement at the beginning that no one, we would not, we would not cut salary lines. And there weren't very many, but there were some. So the positions that were overpaid were going to continue to overpay them based on the Gallagher model? That is correct. I'd like, I think I'd like to wait to vote on this and review the Gallagher um, study a little bit more. Where will that put us if we put this off? Well, um, there's two things. If you vote on this particular agenda item, you're only voting for us to do the mathematics and have it prepared. You're not voting actually to still give the raise or to adopt the study. So you could adopt this motion if you chose to, and it would still mean that we're only implementing and trying to figure out procedurally what it is. And you could still deny and or vote to approve in August. Or you could table the whole thing, and we could say that we simply would not be, we would not be prepared, nor could anyone receive their first check then by September 1, the new start date. So if we approve it late in August, do this. We need to expect probably minimally it would be October before the new compensation package could be paid. And, and that's up to the purview of the board. Also, how many brought up a good question about overpayment? How many people in that deal are, according to the gallery study, I would say four. Four were overpaid. There was one division of, of work that also is an additional four individuals that they they agreed to the pay scale but said that they believed it was an inflated compensation given their role. We didn't agree with that, but no more than eight. So by accepting the or adopting the compensation study, we're not obligating ourselves to go forward with it or go forward with any of the salary recommendations. So Mr. Hayne, you can make the motion to affect that. You could say that you want to make a motion to allow us to process without full implementation until after the August adoption of the budget. You could just phrase it that way if you chose to. Say that. Well, um, you, you basically are saying you would move to approve the processing of the compensation study but the actual implementation would be contingent on the adoption of the 21-22 budget. Okay, if we did that, 
would we still then delay implementation until October? Or could we no. save this and still be able to? No, we would allow us to move forward and place those for a time period to begin September 1. But then if the board voted not to do the compensation study and to agree to it, we would just simply not process that. So it's about a month's work of computer work, if you want to know the truth, though. So by moving to approve, we are simply saying we can go forward with this and have the information available, but we are not obligating ourselves to implement. That is correct. Okay. John, you okay with that? Or you can table the whole thing. Or we can. Or we could table the whole thing. Yeah. If but we then just push it back delaying, from the start here. Yeah, if we end up delaying the increases, and we know there's already some, I don't know, folks are looking at this, so. Well, I, I, I would, if I can make a motion, I move that we approve the processing of the study, but it would be contingent on the adoption of the 2021 2022 budget. Perfect. Okay. We have a second. second. Thank you. We have any discussion on that? All in favor of the uh, motion? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, John. All right. That would move us to. You're back. <laughs> this, this is consideration of approving an RFP for auditing services. And for over a decade, the auditing services here at NCTC have been provided by Shock and Smith, located here in Gainesville. The accounting team here is at the college has been pleased with our working relationship with them, but we also realize that it's prudent to periodically look to have another set of eyes looking over our books, so we decided that we would conduct an RFP for auditing services. In addition to advertising in the Daily Register and the county newspaper, we sent bid packages directly to four specific accounting firms that we knew conducted audits for community colleges in Texas because we had checked with our colleagues at Grayson, Fernie, Temple, and Blinn in order to, to identify those providers. So unfortunately, the only bid proposal that we received was from Chalk and Smith. And I say unfortunately because we would simply have liked to have had more interest and options from which to choose but that being said, we are happy to continue working with our friends at Shaw and Smith, and we're asking the board to accept the proposal submitted by them for auditing services for the college and the foundation over the next five years. Is there any reason that you know of that we went out to that many people and only one person responded? I have no idea. I, I, did only, I specifically heard back from one of them, and it was us. It, it's seemingly a small firm in Bonham, Texas that does Grayson's audit, and they just said because of their manpower that they just did not feel like they would be in a position, and that doesn't surprise me. It sounds like a small town firm, uh, but the others, I, I was it because it was a Wichita City firm, Wichita Falls, it was a um, Temple, uh, folks that did blend in Temple that I worked with at both, and, and I was kind of surprised I didn't at least hear back from him and say, hey, sorry, Dr. Miller, but, you know, that's a little out of our territory. Uh, but I, I did not hear anything back. Do have any questions? How, um, how often do these people come on campus? Very rarely, I would assume. Y'all just send everything to them? Just oh, yeah, yeah. Well, and especially during, yeah. during the totally. pandemic. I mean, it was all done remote. But honestly, they'll have um, usually two different time periods. Um, Usually, sometimes either late in the summer or early in the fall, they come out and do some early groundwork, and then late October, early November, they're here for about a week. We set them up either in here or conference room, give them a workspace, and uh, they collect everything they need. Questions? I would need a motion to approve the RFP for Trump and Smith. I make that motion. I have a second. I'll second. Second. Questions? Discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Both. Carries. Uh, well, you're still up. Another RFP. Uh, RFP for bank, our depository bank services. Um, our, our depository agreement expired a couple of months ago. And much like our situation with auditing, 
We advertised in the local papers, but we also sent bid packages out to five local banks. Just wanted to make sure everyone knew. We sent them to First State Bank, First United, Munster State, Prosperity, and Simmons. And again, the only bid proposal we received was from our current service provider. And in this case, that was First State Bank. Um, we're very pleased with our working relationship that we have there, and we're pleased with the terms of their proposal because it was virtually identical to the terms that were in our previous um, uh, agreement. And so we would ask the board to please accept the bid proposal that was submitted by First State Bank of Gainesville for depository bank services for the next five years. I make a motion to approve First State Bank for said services. Second. Yeah, that's good. Questions? Discussion. All in favor of signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Bells want abstention, please, and the record for Christine Morris. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. We are supposed to now consider setting a date for the Board of Regents to retreat. We are going to be to do it. We, without uh, Chairman Metzler here as well, and let me just say our condolences go to, to Carla and her family at the loss of her mother. That funeral was today. Uh, and so we, we uh, offer our condolences to her. I went to the visitation last evening, great family and very warm uh, reception and I appreciate uh, her work, but we want to know that our thoughts and prayers are with her. She's asked that any donations that are made <coughs> to the foundation to the scholarship that those, her parents established. And so it's exciting that they would think of the college during this time. But I'd like to just uh, admit with your permission, Mr. Chair, just table that. What we're thinking of is a fall. I'm not trying to get one of these in the spring and summer. It's just too busy. I to just get it together for a day's retreat sometime, probably even maybe October. I just wanted to put it in your head and we can get that scheduled. Send out emails appropriately and have a chance to do that. That being the case, that ends the agenda items. I would seek a motion to adjourn. I make said motion. Second, Aaron. All in favor say aye. Or goes on. Aye. Thank you all.